thank you to Sharon and Karen. Uh, thank you all for giving me a chance to speak to you today. Uh, I sort of wish I were speaking to you at the end of the week. Because what I'm going to do is, as I say, take a skeptical look at the concept of open. But what I'd like to do today is talk a little bit about um, how we use the term open uh, not only in not well-defined ways, but in very vague ways. There are a lot of politics that undergird what open is. That's in part what interests us about that. And when I say politics, by the way, I don't necessarily mean electoral politics, but I think about politics as uh, there are many ways to talk about it, but as a way of saying what it is we value and then adjudicating conflicts, because there are always conflicts, Men and women of goodwill have different opinions about what we value, how we should give witness, what sort of public resources, private resources, we may want to put behind what it is that we value. So there's important politics that's going on inside the term open, and I'm going to talk about some of those that it might be worthwhile for us to lift up the rug and look underneath. Can you be anonymous on Facebook? Can you assume a pseudonym? No. Now, there are many good reasons why not, but you don't get to decide that, despite the fact that Facebook likes to present itself as an open platform for all of us to uh, socialize together. One of the important things that the term open obscures is that there is conflict among what are called pro-social values. And, uh, Sharon gave us some indications of that with regard to copyright. We might want to grant creators incentives. You're a great songwriter. You want to make sure you keep writing great songs and distribute them to the rest of us. At the same time, though, we want to make sure that our reward to you is not so large that the rest of us suffer. We can't get to your really interesting work. If I were one of the people with Legionnaire's disease, if I were the owner of property near that place, would I be keen to have information about me as an individual or about my property shared openly? There are good reasons to share it, and there are good reasons not to. By saying we love open, we hide this conflict. But there's a good reason for us to know your real identity. Similarly, um, we all uh, are aware of personal examples where people have been bullied online, where they have been attacked because of the way they look, the opinions they express, the way they dress, uh, any number of reasons. And to hide behind anonymity gives us freedom to be antisocial. But they're the ones you'll see most often evoked time and time again in uh, defense of learning analytics. Students, their parents, legislators, regulators, who are sometimes the same but often different, and employers all are interested in how is it that the university is achieving its business. So we don't look at the instruments. What grade did you get? What test did you take? But rather these more important learning outcomes. And that's what learning analytics says it supports. And it can range from systems that are under the control of the particular educational institution, like course management systems, library resources, uh, student health. So this is a very large and integrated view about what an individually identifiable student does online. Learning analytics are seen, especially in the United States, as key to achieving the outcomes of public education. Who could be against that? How many times have you gone to see the, a school doctor over the course of this academic year? Sometimes we want to know that, but sometimes we don't. So the first question we might ask is, should students, especially young people, who often will change their behavior from peer pressure in a way mature adults do as well. 
But young people are especially vulnerable to that. Should their teachers know? How many people here have been or are teachers? Okay. So I know in some of the systems that we use, I post some material, um, lecture notes, uh, preparation for quizzes, some readings online. And if I would like to, I could know how, if every student has looked at those. Okay. Should I know that? Should that influence how it is I judge students' performance? It puts me in an ethical and moral quandary as an individual. Do I want to surveil my students that way or not? I choose not to, but I, I'm a grown-up. I, I dare to say, Many people in this room are perhaps a third of my age. And you grew up in a world in which this kind of surveillance was normal. I did not. So it's easier for me to say no as a teacher. I don't want to know, did you do that reading? Did you do those practice problems? Did you rewatch that lecture? Okay. But it's difficult for institutions as a whole to say, we don't want our teachers to do that. Should the institution know this about individually identifiable students? We don't know. But what we have done is we've allowed instrumentalism to rule. Because we can find it out, we do. Because we can gather these data, we do. Because we can mine these data, because we can analyze these data, we do. And I would say, by invoking the concept of educational transparency and openness, we hide all of these hard questions. It doesn't mean people aren't aware of them. In fact, every strong proponent of learning analytics says, well, there are privacy implications. And then they push them aside <laughs> and go on and design, distribute, sell. But here's what I think about that no matter what governments or corporations do, we have to be skeptical. Part of what's called in parliamentary systems, part of the loyal opposition. And as we understand that ordinarily, people make decisions for good reasons. It doesn't mean we agree. And in fact, what it means is we need to point out that people could and should disagree. Karl uh, Mannheim had a very useful concept of dangerous thoughts. That one of the things scholars contribute to society <coughs> is by being oppositional, contrarian. We are men and women of ideas. Right? We have two jobs, read and write. That's <laughs> the only two jobs. Okay? Not everyone has that luxury. So how do we bring the benefits of our work to our fellow citizens. We end up with conundra, messes, muddles, wicked problems that are often intractable. And so what I'm saying is when we evoke the concept of open, as you will all through this week, as I said, I was hoping it would be great if I could talk to you at the end of the week and say, yeah, be skeptical. <laughs> but I'm saying it now. Be skeptical as you listen. Not because openness is a bad thing, that transparency is a bad thing. No, but what it means is it's invariably embedded in important political and cultural conflicts that often lie hidden when we don't speak specifically. Okay? And that's all I'd like to say. Thank you for your attention. And uh, let's talk some more. Yeah.